Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, 21 of September. This is our lecture three of our course, Introduction to Power Electronic Solutions. So we are meeting today in this uh, room. Uh, everything is working. Uh, I see that the students found the spot to view because it kind of goes in this diagonal, but sometimes it'll be here. So see me and there is no big pillar in your way. Today I will go through some foundations of some power electronic device. Maybe you have seen that. I will not go into the details of physics, but sometimes we have courses just to understand the physics of those devices, how the electrons flow there, how the holes flow at the PN junctions, and everything about physics. In order to design a power electronics converter, you don't need to know any of those physics. In order to design a power electronics converter, you have to understand how the switches operate, and you have to make uh, some simplifications. Okay. One simplification is to assume that the devices are ideal. Okay. But that doesn't mean it's always, always a switch. For example, a silicon control drug fire is not exactly only a switch. Okay. So today, my intention is to go through this uh, uh, understanding of those devices. And then when you have uh, topologies that we use a uh, diode or a silicon control rectifier, which you call a resistor, by the way, or a transistor, most of the time, my initial analysis would be assuming that the device is ideal. And that means the device can take any voltage and current, even 10,000 to 10 to 12 volts, which is not true, of course. That is not going to happen in real life, okay? But we are not concerned about the constraints of the device that they actually have. When you implement a power electronics converter, you have to understand the constraints. What's the maximum voltage? What's the maximum current? How long does it take to turn on? How long does it take to turn off? What's the maximum frequency of operation? Uh, is there a a leakage, things like that, you know? So, but initially we don't need that. So I share my screen because I'm recording and I want to make sure that the students will watch this. Some students are not in town because they're in Turku or other place. So I promise to leave these uh, videos, you know? But these videos are not professional. Yeah, I have to I have to fix this camera. The camera is not following me. But that's a way to, to proceed. So I'll share the screen. A minute. Screen is not shared yet. Yes. Great. So when I share the screen, I am in that small video. <clears throat> But because I'm here with you, I will minimize that. Okay. And when I share the screen, I went straight to our Moodle. Uh, I, I always work a little bit. Sometimes you do not even notice, but sometimes I, I, I do a little change here or there. Okay. For example, we are on lecture two. So we have here the video for lecture two, but that was not on YouTube. It's MP4. I didn't have time to process in YouTube, but it's okay. You just click and watch. Okay. The end. There was a question about this kilowatt to joule conversion. It's simple, but that's the way to do it. Okay. Uh, today I just click this. This is cool because MATLAB has a lot of documentation. Okay. So if you click here. You can see the 
sì. What can see if... Yeah. Okay, in fact, there'll be a problem here. So digital maps networks, they have several cores in South case form, but this on ramp still is designed. The on ramp has uh, Simscape, Simulink, and electronics, which is pretty much what we do. Okay. The other things are more control systems, signal processing, physical modeling, AI. Okay. So I suggest you, it's not required, it's just a suggestion, but if you want to better yourself, you have to learn something that's meaningful. And MATLAB is meaningful, okay? Simba is also meaningful, but MATLAB is more comprehensive. MATLAB is something that you can apply for a whole variety of diversity of engineering problems. Okay? But in this course, particularly because you have to use our electronics, we are also using single, okay? so we can learn both. I made this available on Moodle here, okay? To come to lecture three, so there is a there is a URL here: MATLAB Simulink Simscape Substudy. I will minimize this. And I go to my slides. Okay. Okay. So I'll talk from here a little bit. When we learn electronics and we learn uh, semiconductors, yeah. we typically learn diodes and then transistors, and depending on the course that you take, it may go along some diodes and transistor circuits and a little bit of R, L, and C, and then you may have the same course or another course operation of fire, so it depends how you learn that in your class. There are several ways that people learn this. But diode is something that will, I believe everyone should be committed because we understand a diode as a device that will flow current just one way. Okay. So we call usually that a diode is a rectifier. We usually say diode rectifier. A diode can, may have other applications, particularly in high frequency. In our case here, we are using the diode in the way that we learn that when the voltage in one terminal is greater than the voltage in another one, a big M F. So that means that the voltage on A is higher than the voltage on K, the diode will come up. Okay. So last class I was just giving this example for a student. So I will repeat you because I don't have all these details. Completely in my slides. About the same If you assume that your diode is ideal, see, I have a diode and I assume that's ideal. When it's ideal, that means any, any voltage that's a little bit higher than that, it turns on. A little bit higher could be a few millivolts, could be just barely the same. So when it's the same, we say that when the voltage is positive here in respect to that, the diode will conduct. So the ideal diode has a curve like this. For the, this is voltage, okay? This is voltage across the diode. When the voltage is negative, my current is zero. Zero. Like that. Okay? When my voltage is positive, that means as soon as I go to that side of the plane, then you conduct and you give me any voltage. So this is how the diode will switch from off to on. Okay? And you see here that there is no limit. 
My current, this is a current in the diagram. My current could go to infinity. And my voltage here, negative, could go to minus infinity. So what you are assuming, which is not, of course, true in reality, is that the diode will uh, withstand any negative voltage, okay? And as soon as the voltage is positive, and when the diode is ideal, that means millivolts, it turns on. When it turns on, the current that goes to the diode is any current, because it's ideal, okay? In real life, there is a maximum negative voltage, we call breakdown voltage, okay? And there is a maximum current that's not indicated here, but your diode will have ID max, okay? There's a maximum current. How do you know? You have to look into the specifications of that, that diode. When, when you look to the, what we call data sheet or specification sheet, so usually it's a table and then it says maximum reverse voltage is like say 100 volts, maximum on current continuous is I'd say five amps. Okay, what else it may say? It may say uh, voltage drop is 0.7 volts for some some conditions. The conditions are usually described by physics. So we have an exponential response that connects my voltage in my diode with the current diode. Do we have to use the exponential response? Not usually in this class, okay? But when you do an electronic circuit, when you have to really be careful with the semiconductor features, then you have to have a very specific exponential curve. But we can make two approximations. The first approximation is simple. Instead of assuming that turn on at zero, I assume that turn on at a certain rate. <laughs> so we usually use 0.7 or 0 0.6. Okay, why? Because when we study silicon diodes, there is a PN junction. A PN junction is an internal barrier. It's like a field that the, the electrons will have to overcome that field in order to overcome that field because it's a, a property of the material and it's a property of the concentration of the topping of the silicon. It can go from 0.6 to 0.7, but that's not exact. That's also uh, a simplification. Okay? But this is a, a, a good uh, simplification, it's not bad. Okay? Because we assume that there is a voltage drop and the voltage drop doesn't change, 0.7. So most of the time when we learn electronics, we learn like this. A diode will have 0.7 across the diode. It's okay, it's a simplification. Okay? The, the reality is you have an exponential response. For example, a LED, a LED, a LED, it, it emits diodes. So what's a LED? It's a very cool diode because it has lights. <laughs> okay. And nowadays, they are everywhere. We have light bulbs, we have so many applications for LEDs or LEDs. When I was a student, they were not so, how to say, useful. They are just to show in a panel that something was on or off. Just kind of a signal, you know, just to indicate that something was going on. But today we have uh, LEDs that are very powerful. There are LED, LEDs that have uh, uh, ultraviolet. For example, my wife, she makes her nails and she has a thing with LEDs and then she uses a, use a globe to protect her hands and then she burns the nails. Okay, so the LEDs there, they give some light, but a lot of ultraviolet, okay? So there are LEDs that you give you lasers. There are all sorts of LEDs. Okay? There are diodes. And in th those cases, the voltage will depend on the fabrication of the diode. 
the border should be 0.5, the border should be even one or two or three volts, depending on the diode, okay? But they are diodes, okay? In our case, we want diodes that will withstand a negative voltage. See, when the voltage is negative, the current is zero. And when the, when the voltage is positive, it flows, but maybe there is some no ideal case. The first no ideal case is 0.7. In order to model this, I could say that this diode here is ideal, and then I will have a 0 0.7 volts voltage drop. Okay? The diodes, particularly the ones that are for high voltage and high current applications, they have a lot of silicon. Okay? Because they have a lot of silicon, there is a lot of resistance on the material. So when the current flows to the diode, in addition to overcoming the potential barrier of 0.7 volts, it flows to a resistance and the diode heats. Okay? So when the diode heats, you have to maybe to have a heat sink for the diode, or maybe you have to have uh, forcing ventilation. You have to have a fan that blows air. Depends on the application, okay? Particularly for high power application. So we ought to make the assumption that there is a resistance. Okay? Let's say R D ohm. Okay? So if, if we assume that this is a model for a diode, okay? then you can say that this is A and K of your real diodes. Okay, but inside the real diode, you are making an assumption that you have an ideal diode plus a barrier of 0.7 that depends on the, on the material. When it's silicon, it's either 0.7 or 0.6. We don't have, we have, but it's not common. We don't have germanium diodes anymore because germanium diodes will stop to be manufactured a few years ago, but sometimes you find. And you have shock tip diodes. They have a lower voltage. So shock tip diodes, they have a voltage drop of 0.2 or 0.3. So they are cool because you, you have less voltage drop. Why it's important to have a low voltage drop or low resistance? I'm going to ask, I'm going to see your maturity on this question. Why? Hmm? Dissipation. Dissipation, yes. But going along the dissipation, what's the impact of the system? Oh, losses, that's right, losses. Because you have a lot of heating, that means uh, power that should be converted is lost. Because power is lost, the efficiency of your converter is less. So if, so if you want to have a very high efficient converter, you have to decide on using transistors and diodes that first will have a very low voltage drop, a very low resistance from the points of uh, the current control. That is called uh, conduction losses. Okay? Conduction losses are losses, losses mean loss, are losses when your device is on. Okay? Yes. So, a part of the converter will have several diodes that will be on and off. When they are off, theoretically they are not dissipating, but sometimes they are, because maybe they have a leak. Okay? But theoretically, when, when they are off, they are not dissipating. So, when they are on, they have the conduction loss. And every time you turn on or you turn off, you have a response of a current that will blow up a voltage that will come down, and then there is an overlapping. That overlapping, when you multiply the I and D, you have a peak, okay? Or switch on to off, or switch off to on, again, a peak. So a, a device that you turn on and off in a power electronics converter will have conduction losses plus Two switching losses. Okay, every time you go from one to on to off and from off to on. 
initially in our in our for electronics we do not consider them we consider them to be ideal but as soon as your circuit is operational the next step the next thing you should do it is to make sure that the known idealities will not affect the performance of your converter. Okay? That's one of the things. We, we don't have time that in this course, but in this course we're learning. I am assuming that we're learning this for the first time. Otherwise, it won't be an introduction course, it will be an advanced course. So, because we are an introductory course, we don't have time to go into the details of the design of a system to make sure that the no ideal components are taken care. In order to do that, we can make measurements on the lab or we can use some advanced simulators. That's why it's important to learn simulation. For example, I'm not sure how powerful Simba is for this. Maybe it is because Simba is also new for me. I'm very familiar with several other, other platforms, but Simba is new. Simba is a new product. They, yeah, it has been made in the past one or two years. Okay? But for example, LT Spice. LT Spice is one for that. Plex is another one that's very good for this kind of uh, evaluation. Okay? But we don't have time for So a diode will provide what we call uncontrolled rectification. Why is uncontrolled? Because you do not have control on the device itself. It depends on the voltage being higher here than there. So when you have a circuit, depending on the operation of a circuit, as soon as the voltage on the anode is greater than the voltage of the cathode, the current will flow. But it's not your control. You, don't, you do not have a command to make it on, to make it off. Okay? So it's an uncontrolled rectifier. Uh, it's used in applications that uh, will usually make a DC supply. When you have AC and you want to have DC, you are going to use diodes. Okay? A simple case is for power supplies. So probably you learn in electronics, hopefully, that you can use diodes as a half wave or as a full wave, and then you may have a capacitor. And then you have mm -hmm. a, a voltage that will be C. So this is typical for electronics when you just learn electronics. I'm going to show that as well, but I'm going to show you a little bit more advanced use of diodes. Okay? Because diodes can be used for industrial applications. For example, you are doing electroplating, you are anodizing a uh, metal, you, you are doing a battery charge. We're doing something that is for 10,000 amps, not for 1 million. So we have to use configurations that they are safe. And even, even if this is new for you, you're going to see an application that will be a little more to, to the industrial side of using diodes. Okay. Okay. So diodes, that's it. This is pretty much what we have been discussing. Okay. We have uh, some types of diodes. You see here the, the terminology, line frequency diodes, fast recovery diodes, shot diodes, silicon carbide diodes, okay? Line frequency diodes are diodes for the frequency of the line. What's the line? That one, it's the hertz, it's the hertz, okay? So it's whatever you have, in our power supply that comes to our view for all line fields. So those diodes, they will respond well for 50 hertz, 60 hertz. Maybe they will respond up to 100 hertz, 200 hertz, that's it. Okay? They are not fast, but they are made for that application. Then we have the fast recovery diodes. They are diodes that will turn on uh, faster and turn off better. I want to discuss the turn off of diodes. The shock of diodes, they are uh, specific diodes and it has even a symbol for that. Do I have some more? I think there is a something here on this on this bar. 
I don't use much shot of diet, okay? but there is a single product. And the shot of diet, the advantage is that it has a low voltage. But usually shot dyes are fair to low voltage drop. But usually shot dyes are for very low current application, like one to three amps. And the reverse voltage is also not, not big, it's almost 60 volts and under volts. So anything that's beyond that, it's not made. So shot with dyes are nice for maybe uh, your battery, your iPhone, your smartphone power supply. And you want to have a very low voltage drop in the system that you charge your back. So you can see shot type. And silicon carbide is a new material. We have several materials that we make this device, and the most common one is silicon. Silicon is one that we make with diodes, transistors, and can but uh, on the past few years, we have uh, had some advances in this material that silicon carbide. It has silicon, and I'm not an expert on metallurgy uh, things, but as far as I understand, the silicon carbide is a cousin of diamond, pretty much. Okay? So silicon carbide is a kind of diamond, but right? it's like an industrial diamond. That was made for that. So, silicon carbide is a new material that we can make diodes and transistors. The advantages are they are extremely fast, they work in extremely high frequency, and they withstand extremely high voltage. It's very, very cool. But it's a new material, it has been on the market in the past year. So, we only have a few companies manufacturing silicon carbide. And most of these devices, they are still happening here. They are still okay. They <laughs> don't. I don't know to follow the IT one, for example. So a silicon carbide device, uh, today, I am not following the, the latest uh, device, but we are usually for 200 volts, 300 volts, 400 volts. So sometimes it could be useful, but we have other materials that uh, are silicon or, or or other technology that are less expensive than silicon carbide. So why why are you going to use silicon carbide mostly? Because you really want to achieve a very high frequency of operation. And high high frequency operation I mean uh, the C to C converter that's operating at one megahertz, two megahertz. Not, uh, not very not a lot of people. Or a very high temperature because they work well in 200 cells to 300 cells. So that means the dissipation for silicon carbide is less than silicon. However, things usually do not work well in 200 cells. Maybe the, the silicon carbide works, but the inductor is not going to work. The inductor is going to pretty much not have any, any magnetization at all. And some capacity will not work. So it's very limited. Actually, the advantage of silicon carbide, but it's an area that has been growing, and the name of the area is the wide band gap. Okay, silicon carbide is a wide band gap. What's a wide band gap? It is a terminology of the physics that's behind the thing. I'm not an expert because I'm a power plant designer, I'm not a physics professor, but I, 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 I read what is available or when I go to a you got a question? Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting actually. I was thinking that in terms of electron mobility, why is that there? Shall we be Yes, given that gravity that one is over the silicon carbide, G and which is called helium nitride. They are white men. 
Yes, uh, so now it is our last thing being practical and Srikan, still Srikan, Srikan is more popular than Srikan. I think people use both in some situations, some devices are better in one way than the other way. And there are manufacturers that do one thing in another one, okay? But this is an evolving area. We are gonna hear more and more about white band gap, silicon carb carbide, gallium nitride. And it's, uh, it's expected, expected that in the next five to 10 years, we're going to have more devices that are wideband gap than what we have today. So we do not know if they will overcome or not the silicon, if the silicon uh, technology will be dead. I don't know, maybe not, but we're gonna hear more. We're gonna have more transistors, more diodes. We're gonna have more manufacturers. This area is still growing a lot, okay? But I do not know all the advantages of uh, silicon carbide versus gallium nitride or versus another one. I know that there are too many names, too many materials, and it does not interest me. What interests me is circuits and electronics and control. Okay? But there are conferences on that. There are books on that. There are many people who are discussing this. People, for example, discuss reliability. What's the reliability of uh, an electronic circuit? How is it going to fail? It's going to withstand 100 Celsius or maybe 200 Celsius. So what is the aging of a device? The device is going to, to, to age faster with this or with that configuration, if it's silicon carbide or if it's silicon or if it's a gallium nitrate. There are people doing this stuff, okay? One very strong group is in Albert. In Albert, they do this kind of study, the reliability, and they understand this semiconductors. Another one is close to the place where I used to work. I used to work at Colorado Stock Mines in Boulder. In, uh, in Boulder, in Colorado, which is very close to Golden, there is a group of uh, Drag uh, Maximovich and Professor Bob Erickson, and there's another guy who joined them. And they do this kind of studies and reliability and semiconductors. Okay. But it's not my expertise. Okay. okay, so continue on diodes. This is a very simple application. So I'm not gonna take too much time because I'm expecting that you should uh, you should understand how this works. Suppose I have a, an AC voltage. AC voltage should be 50 hertz. We have a peak voltage VP. Okay. When the AC voltage is positive, the diode is turned on. So it's on. When the AC voltage is negative, the diode will turn off. So you expect that the diode will have a certain voltage on. Okay. And the voltage across our loads will be VAC minus VD. So what you have here is the peak value is VP. Minus the voltage drop. Okay, so the voltage drop could be only the 0.7, or could be 0.7 plus the resistance multiplied by the current. This is the resistance of the diode. Okay, so when you do this, you have this across your diode, so your diode will be on with a certain voltage, and then when it's off, it will stand the voltage. Okay, and across your loads, you have a pulse when it's positive, zero, and a pulse. Okay, we call this halfway rectifier, very simple. And uh, if you put a capacitor here, capacitor will charge, and then you charge, then you charge again. Okay, so you easily make a uh, DC power supply, but that power supply it doesn't have a very good regulation. Because it works. There is a decay of the capacitor, and the capacitor may discharge faster if the loads too heavy. Okay, there is a ripple, there is a variation on the on the output. Okay. And uh, is a crude power supply. It's a power supply. It's a power supply that maybe you could use for something that 
is not very, how to say, sophisticated and could work with this kind of rhythm, okay? But we are not going to discuss this circuit too much. Let's see what comes next. Uh, that's just a discussion about power diode. A power diode will be a diode that was completely made for high voltage application. So this is goes into physics. So if I want to have a diode that instead of 100 volts, we stand 5,000 volts, the diode should be longer. Okay? Why? Because voltage will break a material depending on the distance. In the air, the air like this, if you have uh, one millimeter, one millimeter, just imagine one millimeter, you can take your, your finger and make uh, one millimeter, it's almost touching. Wow, it's touching. Okay, a millimeter. So one millimeter of air, if you apply a thousand volts or a little more than a thousand volts, you're gonna have a spark. Okay, because that voltage breaks there. So how can we make this better? Ah, you have to have a better insulation. However, dry air or vacuum is one of the best. So usually we assume that a thousand volts per millimeter is a kind of constant. That's why machines, they do not have high voltage. Because when you have a, a one and you have a turn that's very close to another one, it's close to one millimeter. If that voltage of one wine, one third of the next is close to a thousand volts, you're gonna have a spark, you're gonna break the air. When you break the air, you have current flowing through the air and you damage the circuit. So, what we have is in order to have a high voltage diode, we apply voltage here and we stack a lot of materials, first of all. Okay? So, usually the diodes that are for high voltage application. They are very bulky. I don't gonna break any device here, but sometimes you have a small device like this, and it's for, let's say, 200 volts. And then you have a device that's for 20 kilovolts. It's like the size of a pen. It's very, very big. Okay. But when you have these uh, very big diodes, there's a lot of resistance. So there's a lot of losses when it turns on. Okay. Now, when the diode will turn off, inside of the diode, we had electrons flowing one way, and then there's a field, is the barrier. And as soon as I want to turn off, they have to recombine the electrons. They have to go with the holes, and there is a, there is a recombination inside of your PN junction that makes the, the device to turn on. And that takes time. When that takes time, that means what? If your diode was on first, it's not gonna go off instantaneously. When you say it's ideal, we assume that goes to zero, okay? But when it's not ideal, it's going to go down, but it doesn't stop here. There is a certain time that becomes negative and then set goes down to zero. Okay. So your diodes have a certain time to turn off. Okay. The time to turn off is your fall time plus this time here. And the measurement is called RR, reverse voltage. So when you look to a diode specification, in addition to maximum voltage, maximum current, uh, maximum everything, you're going to see the time for recovery, reverse recovery time. Okay? That is typically, depends on, depends on the diode, that could be one microsecond, two microseconds, if the diode is bad. If the diode is good, it would be uh, less than one microsecond, maybe 500 microseconds. If the diode is very, very, very good, would be five nanoseconds, one nanoseconds. Okay. But still, there is a time for a diode to turn on. Okay? And that's the reverse recovery. We still have the falling time. 
Okay. So the whole thing here is how long it takes for a current for a dye to turn on. Okay. Okay, we are not doing this here, but if you remember, uh, last class I told you how do we we measure RMS. When you calculate RMS is the square root of one divided by T integral in one period of the current square root. However, that works well when you have a mathematical formulation. When you don't have a mathematical formulation, you, you, you split in segments. And when you split in segments, you can try to study the RMS per segment. For example, here, I could say that there is a rectangle here, there is a triangle here, and there is a triangle. Okay. So if you know the RMS of a rectangle, RMS of this triangle, and RMS of that triangle, and you know the times, then you use the formulation I gave you last class to approximate the RMS calculation. The other way is to do mathematical. Okay? There is no other way. Or if you're doing simulation, you can use the measurement tools in your simulator, and hopefully that will be working well. Sometimes uh, the simulators they give you errors also. Okay, so this is kind of uh, putting together the whole discussion so far. The ideal dial goes from on to off instantaneously. The real dial, you go from on to off with some kind of crazy reversal over time. And when you have Slow dials, they are on the order of the microseconds. When you have fast dials, they are on the order of some nanoseconds. But usually we have this problem here. When you have a very fast dial, there is a big negative current here. So what's the, what's the issue here? This is on, isn't it? That's where the current was supposed to, to go. Because when the dial is on, the current goes that way. If the current is negative, the current is going the other way. What I'm saying is this. When it's on, I'm going this way, 100 amps. When it's off, I go a little bit for one amp and then I go to zero. So this might be a problem, okay? In some real circuits, okay? We are not discussing this in this class. But the reverse recovery is like a short circuit on the opposite side. So it can create some problems, it can create some issues when you when you assemble your circuit and you want it to work in real life. This is again about diet reverse recovery and an estimation of the switching losses. Okay, this is another device. Uh, we never saw ANTN transistor and PNT transistor in our life, in our previous work. Everybody here has seen electronics, and you know, or you have an idea that we don't have to do it. Because my intent is also not to teach the device, but to discuss how it's applicable to our Okay. So, uh, a transistor that's NPN or BNP, you know that you have junctions. So, there is a junction from base to emitter and base to collector, okay? When it's NPN, the current will flow from collector to emitter. When it's PNP, the current will flow from emitter to collector. See, it can flow this way, but this is emitter, okay? What's the difference? Here I put current that way, and here I take current that way. So, NPN transistor, I send current to the base, and then it Turn on. A PNP transistor, I provide a path for my base for the current to flow, and then the transistor. Okay. This was very important many years ago when we didn't have other transistors. But uh, we, uh, we, we call an NP, PNP transistor BJT bipolar junction transistor. Why bipolar? Bipolar because 
we have two junctions, okay? And uh, that's it. <laughs> and another thing is, there is a way to, to discuss this that I, I don't want to go in details here because it's not important for the report, but you want to minimize the voltage from collector to emitter. So you have to go in the saturation region. Saturation region means the lowest voltage is possible in your collector region. So that means the base current that flows should be the collector current divided by beta. And I have to have a, a circuit that inject that current and then remove that current to turn on. I used to do this when I was 19, 20 years old. I used to do circuits for BJPs because I was working already. I was in my internship, but I was working already switching to power supply. And that time, this was in 1981, 1980. And that time, uh, we didn't have uh, power mismatches. We didn't have IGB, so we just had BJP. So in order to make uh, the BJP to work, we really had to have very complicated circuits to send the base current and to remove the base current. So it was like uh, an expertise that we had to develop. And I learned with people who did that. Okay? And the way, the way that we learned, we had books, but the way that we learned was taking TV sets, disassemble the TV sets, and understand the schematics of TVs and radios. That's the way we did. Okay. So I had all the schematics of Philips TV and Philip TV and these kind of TVs. And we try to understand how the circuits for the flyback that generates a thousand volts for the cube. It was working. So from there, we try to make a design that was kind of made by the TV method. But we didn't have courses. Okay, so this is kind of old stuff. People do not use BJPs for power electronics anymore. Okay, but it's important to understand. This is the discussion I had. You send a base current. Okay, your base current should be very high, so you bring your circuit to the saturation. Okay, so your circuit will be either on saturation or off. So when your transistor is saturated. This EE is a low voltage. The, the, the low voltage depends on this family of curves, but it's here. It's typically 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts. That depends on the condition. It's less than 0.7. Okay. So, I, but the problem is this: it takes time to turn on and turn off, and it's kind of nasty to really do all the electronics for that. And these BJTs, they fail. When you have a cutoff, what happens, you have uh, a possibility of having a voltage that you break down in your transistor. In addition, we had heating and dissipation concerns. So the failure of transistors in that time that used BJTs were, was very high. When I was doing my internship, I did my internship for four years before I became an engineer, because in Brazil, the engineering program takes five years. So when I was in my last year, I was an intern, but I was with experience like an engineer, because I was working on this for a long time. And I was working this lab and we're doing these uh, transistors and switching power supplies and everything. And every time a transistor die failed, you put in a bucket, a bucket. And the senior people, they had buckets full of transistors. So when I was 21 or 22, my bucket was almost full. <laughs> I burned a lot of transistors in my life. This is not good, but that was the way to do it. We didn't have simulations at that time. So we had to do things. Sometimes things caught fire, scolded, burned. I burned many, many devices in my life by because of this. But today, because we have simulations, we can do 
the design in a safe way. So when you go to the lab, at least you have a theoretical perspective that things are working before we didn't even have the theoretical perspective. No? So BJTs are like this, but what are used today are the power MOSFETs and the IEDs. Okay? A power MOSFET, we have several types. Uh, depletion, enhancement, but 99% of the time we have these devices. That's enhancement. The way it works is like this when our gate is positive and is higher than a certain threshold, the, your switch will conduct and you have VDS on. Okay? So I'm going to draw this here because I discussed a little bit about this device. That's the symbol. It's a kind of complicated symbol. Why is like this? Because a power MOSFET is a, is a, a silicon. It's a piece of silicon. And here you see that you have these gaps. Okay? That means that is sorry, you are on the on the on this pillar. Uh, when the gate is zero, there is no current. That's the idea. So that's why I have this gap. There's no current flowing. Okay. There are some MOSFETs that when the gate is zero, the current is one. Okay. We don't have the same here, but the depletion like that. Okay. So we have the enhancement of the depletion, and then our gate should be either positive or negative. There is a lot of combination. And there is a transistor called JPET, the fat transistor. So the JPET adjunction fat, junction fuel the fat transistor. It's very good for high frequency operations, oscillators, uh, demodulators, radio stuff, things like that. Maybe Wi Fi circuits. But Wi Fi is still, uh, still black man. But the way it works like this when our gate is positive in respect to this terminal here, okay, there's a voltage loop, VGS. When that voltage is positive, then this will conduct the drain to source. So it's very similar to the NPN transistor. What's the advantage of the power MOSFET? It's very simple to drive the gate because you just apply voltage. You don't have to inject current. The voltage must be higher than a certain threshold. So when you buy your power MOSFET, you're going to see that the threshold voltage is, let's say, 4 volt. So the device will turn on if you apply more than four volts. And then depending on the device, you turn off with zero or we may turn off with a negative voltage, that depends on which device. And then from drain to source, drain to source, I have a resistance. So from here to here, there is a, an equivalent resistance. So one parameter that we had for MOSFETs is R yes. Okay. RDS is the resistor from the drain to source. And for very high efficient transistors, what they expect of RDS to be higher or lower? Lower. That's right. So if you find a transistor that the RDS is 0.5 ohms and another transistor that's 0.05 ohms. So we're going to buy the 0.05 ohms. However, that's going to be 10 times more expensive than that. <laughs> but that's it. So when you define a power MOSFET, you have to also look to the voltage of operation, to the frequency of operation, things like that. But typically, one very important issue is what is the resistance from grain port? And we typically buy the transistor that has the lowest resistance. Okay? 
the issue is cost, and sometimes the issue is availability. Because, for example, I remember we used to make uh, uh, circuits for set motors. Set motor is a small motor that we usually use in robotics, and as you turn on and turn on in a certain way, it moves. So it goes one way, it goes another way, but in sets. That's why we call it set motor. Okay. And we have many transistors there. And we want the, the, the circuit for the step model to have high efficiency. So we want to select a power MOSFET that has a very low RDS. I remember that when I did a circuit like this long time ago, I found uh, someone who had a very good price in one million uh, MOSFETs. I was very happy because I bought those one million MI3 homes. Uh, my lab where it's work, and then we made it, everybody was happy. However, we never found the device anymore. And when we found it was very expensive. So it was like, uh, I don't know, maybe it was a lot that was with the wrong price. We do not know, but we, we found something that was one million. But eventually, when you had to really make the, the, the things to sell because we're selling that stuff, we just found transistors with any one of one. So the heat sink that was very small for one case was kind of hot for the second case. So I had to put a fan. Okay. So you find a way, because engineers do this, they find a way to make the system work. Okay. So it's kind of hot, a fan, but you have to have air. Okay. Don't have air, it doesn't help to put a fan. Okay, so this is a power MOSFET. Power MOSFETs are still useful. They are still used, okay? The power MOSFETs can be used for DC DC power supplies, DC DC converters, uh, robotics, many things, many things. Uh, step motors, small motors. Another day I found that, uh, I was surprised that these hair drivers, the modern hair drivers, they have a small motor that runs at 120,000 RPM. Because my wife was saying, this is 120,000 RPM. No, but... <laughs> she said, have you seen it? It's right here, 120,000 RPM. She's not an engineer. I said, no, this is not true. And then I went to try to find it. And China makes those damn motors, you know? <laughs> 120,000 RPM. But it's a motor that you have to have electronics to drive. So you have to have transistors to turn on and turn on. So you have to have also very fast transitions for them. So a hair dryer today is not is very sophisticated when compared to the past because you have those machines that run on very high speed. You have electronics, you know, so it's it's way more sophisticated technologically to dry your hair. Okay, most fat is here, and they were invented in 1978. But the first time I used a power MOSFET in my life was in 1984, 1983. But this was in like, okay, I was in Brazil, so it took time for to have the distribution of these devices in Brazil. But I remember when I just saw a power MOSFET and I had a power supply. The power supply was made to operate at 20 kilohertz. And I just took the, the old transistor I brought this transistor, I replaced the gate driver, and I made it work in 100 kilowatts. Okay, so it worked like that. It was like magic, because suddenly my my power supply that was the cassette and performance at 20 kilowatts was much better at 100 kilowatts. But when you have high frequency design, you have to, you have to be careful with uh, electromagnetics, radio frequency interference, other problems. Okay, so power MOSFETs, and this was written a few years ago when I, I this is my handbook, but I did this slide a few years ago. So I wrote to the power MOSFET that's called 500 volts, 1 kV. But I believe now we have power MOSFETs with more than 1 kV. Okay. But you don't find power MOSFETs with 10 kV. Power MOSFETs are maximum 2 kV, 2 kV. So when you buy this device, it has a maximum voltage of application 
and it has a maximum current for drain source. So you have to see where it uh, where it's used for application. Okay? The device that are better for industrial application is the IGBT. Okay. This is insulated gate by four the insulated gate by four transistor is a hybrid. It's a combination of a silicon transistor with a power transfer. That's why we have this symbol. Because inside of the IGBT, of course, it's integrated. Okay? But the person who invented the IGBT, Professor, I think he's still alive from North Carolina, he was more in microelectronics. He took the silicon carbide transistor, not silicon carbide, the silicon transistor, and then he thought, what's good in silicon transistor? The, the, the base is there, because I have to put current. So I want to have something that's not uh, in current. So why do you have uh, something bad in the power monster? So the power monster that I have this voltage input. However, the power monster has a resistance. And the collector emitter of the silicon, it doesn't change the voltage. The resistance changes because it's proportional to the current. So because it was working microelectronics, he made a structure that half was silicon and half was power MOSFET, and inside he connected. Of course, when he did for the first time, maybe he had some issues and some constraints, but he he realized that it was a very cool had a pattern, and uh, that pattern was around 1990, because in 1990, we already had a degree, okay? And uh, he became very famous with this invention. But now IGBTs, they are made by several manufacturers and it's the natural choice for particles. IGBTs, they have the advantage of a low voltage drop on the collector meter and a gate that is voltage controlled like a formal spectrum. So it has the both good features, okay? good features of the power MOSFETs plus the good features of the silicon uh, device. Okay? IGBTs, they are uh, made for a collector emitter like this. And the maximum voltage here for an IGBT, I believe, is. You can find the LGBT for 20 kV, 25 kV. I don't like to have more for more than 25 kV. Okay. You can think that 25 kV is a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. But of course, we have applications that they need more than 25 kV, particularly in transition. Okay. When you work with things that are closer to the user, okay, you have a, component, a device that's connected to the wall. You offer your wall speed to 130 volts AC. Okay. So an IGBT is great, okay? but if you have something that could be connected to a substation, the substation has a power electronics that will go to the transmission side, then you have uh, hundreds of people. Okay? So in that case, you may have configured that you have IGBT set, or you have topology that you have a combination of circuit. Or you have to use something that people think it's obsolete, but it's not. It's the silicon controller by the SCR. But the SCRs, they are made for really, really high voltage. Okay? So IGBTs are the way of doing business with transistors for industrial applications. It's kind of similar to a silicon uh, NPN. However, it doesn't work on the active region, it's only on and off. So an IGBT is made to turn on and turn off. Okay? So if you're learning electronics, or you learn that uh, a silicon NPN, you have to drive it to saturation, because if you don't drive it to saturation, you have a voltage in the active region that's very high and that will impact the performance. An IGBT is either on or off. There is no between, there is no activity. So you cannot use an IGBT for uh, a regular amplifier. You would just use an IGBT for turning on and turning off. And usually IGBTs, they are optimized for a frequency. So when you buy an IGBT, 
the manufacturer is going to say this LGBT is for 25 kilowatts. Yes. This LGBT is for maximum 40 kilowatts. And probably for it to be more expensive, but you have to use what the manufacturer suggests. So it's made for that particular. So all the circuits will be studied in this class. They could be easily implemented with LGBT. So those are the characteristics comparing IGBT with BJT and MOSFETs. We are trying to compare the voltage drop. This is a transistor called static induction transistor. It was made in Japan and it was very important a few years ago, but it's uh, no longer available. The company was token. But they closed, and I don't know if this is manufactured. The static induction transistor was a transistor that was normally on. So when you have a voltage, then you turn off. So it was like a vacuum tube. You know the vacuum tube that you, you are doing? Young. I've seen a vacuum tube, but the vacuum tube was very common. Usually, I have way use, so probably you're going to see vacuum tubes on TVs. Uh, or maybe if you watch a movie, you're going to see a vacuum tube, okay? But the vacuum tube is a glass that has uh, plasma and it has a plate. And then the current will flow through, through that uh, gas, okay? And if you do not apply any voltage, the current will flow. And as you apply voltage, you, you try to control that current that flows. So it's very simple. This, this is not a uh, glass. So this is a semiconductor. Okay. So that's what we're using. The ideal power return switch. The ideal power return switch, I have a control signal. And as I turn it on, I switch. So I don't have any loss. When I turn off, it's completely off. Never breaks down. And it's antenna. Okay. So if you're doing this uh, first homework, you're using an ideal switch like that. And if you happen to use a, a transistor in Simba or Simscape, then you have some parameters, okay? So my recommendation is try to lower the voltage drop, try to make your transistor to be as ideal as possible. Just try to use the ideal switch. You can use the transistor also. So no, it's not, not a problem. You can still use the transistors in our simulation, okay? But my recommendation is to understand the system like an ideal switch that turn on or turn off. So we have the diode that you turn on and turn off depending on the conditions of the circuit. And then we have a switch that we impose to turn on and turn off. That's a transition. Okay, so I didn't have uh, the silicon control required here. Maybe this will come in another in another lecture. Sometimes I have that, but we take too much time to discuss that. A silicon control rectifier is a diode with a controller. There is another another terminal here. Okay. And then as you apply voltage here, you apply voltage here. You make your thyristor, this is called thyristor, silicon control rectifier, SCR. SCR is silicon control rectifier. We also call thyristor. Okay. A thyristor was invented by General Electric in 1958. Uh, so we assume that the birth of power electronics is that year. because power electronics were only possible after we had the invention of thyristors. Because the transistors at that time they were very weak; they could only drive a few milliamps. They could not drive anything higher than a few milliamps, and therefore low voltage. And when General Electric invented the thyristor, the silicon. Fire. Then we had a device that was capable to 
turn on and off hundreds of and several amps. So power electronics was born with the invention of thyristor. I believe it was 1958. Yeah. Okay, so now we have here this circuit. This circuit will be our homework too. Okay. I didn't put homework two on Moodle yet. I will put homework two on Moodle today or tomorrow, but that's your homework. How are we going to work with this homework? Same group that you have now. So whoever you're working with, the same person or people will be the same. The only thing is that if you're doing something in MATLAB, you have to do in Simba. If you're doing something in Simba, you have to do in MATLAB. You have to swap your simulator. Why? Because I want you to learn both. Okay, so what's this? I have 30 volts DC. I have this circuit here that is an inductor and a diode. And my diode, I will make the assumption that the diode is ideal, but I have a resistance here. In my switch, I made the assumption that is ideal, but I have a resistance. Why am I doing that? Because when I do this, I'm trying to simulate losses. So you can still use ideal switches, but if you want to take a look on the losses, you can add a resistance here, and you can add a resistance here. Okay? And then you turn on and turn off the switch. So this is kind of similar to the previous one, but the previous one was a third switch. The previous one was a voltage source and a current source. In this case, this inductance here, when it's very big, it behaves like a current source, but 200 mm is not very big. Okay? So what's going to happen is this. When I switch here, my voltage is applied to my inductance, so I have L and R. So the current in our inductor, in our inductor will go up. Okay. And when I switch off, there was a current flowing here. As soon as I switch off, that current keeps flowing here. And when that current keeps flowing here, we call this free wheeling path. That's the name. That's the technical name. Why? Because it's a path for the current to continue the circulation. We also call flying wheel path, free wheel and fly wheel, both are the same technology. So we are going to see that our current that was flowing here, it starts to flow here, and your the voltage in our inductor will reverse automatically. As in the voltage in our inductor will reverse automatically, you start pushing current to the dive, so it circulates here, and here I have 20 ohms. So what happens is that the current that was here, it starts to decay. And then you can turn on again. And then you turn on, and turn on again, and turn on. If your frequency wave is very high, very low, then what's going to happen is this. You turn on, and then you turn off, and then you wait. So it depends on how fast you turn on and turn off. So I'm asking you to make for the situation, vary the frequency, understand how the circuit works. And before you do the simulation, it's important that you understand the math, okay? So I'm gonna give you time, because next week I have to travel. I will be away for home. But I will be here for the, for the class on Thursday, or when is our next class? No, Thursday or Friday. So I will be here for this class, okay? In this class, I want to discuss the theoretical perspective of this. And then, of course, you do a lecture, but you have seven days to try to understand this. 
right, to understand how is the man try to put together a simulator, try to get your work started, okay? And uh, the deadline for publication of his homework will be after homework one. So homework one, if the deadline is coming two days, this will be one week after. I'm gonna say, ah, that's not enough. I don't know, I'm gonna have more homework and more process. So this is just for you to get your, how to say, your perception and how is a power electronic simulation and how to do something. Is it a like here you can get in the year two months from the slides. What is it? The deadline for two months. But in the English 28th, September. Okay. I put September. In the English 28th, September. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I make these mistakes. I usually make mistakes with months. That's normal with me. Not good, of course, but sometimes I, I have. A so let me end the recording. So if you are watching this, please take a look on last slide because that's your homework, okay? Whoever is watching this. End and meeting for all.